Hey everybody, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. Mini painting. Like many of you, I've noticed a pretty big change on the platform on YouTube in the miniature painting space over the last couple of years. Hobby YouTube used to be a place where creators were just like regular folks showing what they were doing, passing on what little knowledge they had, and essentially on the same level as a lot of the viewers, or at least not that far ahead of them in terms of skill. This has changed. Along with increasing production values has come a massive increase in the talent of creators in the hobby space on YouTube. And this is most noticeable on videos focused specifically on mini painting. The platform is full of master painters painting models at an exceptionally high skill level. People who treat mini painting like fine art. And that's cool, I respect that, but I gotta be honest, it's not for me. I don't have that kind of patience and I don't have that kind of skill. And this massive increase in talent on YouTube can be very discouraging. I'm not a good mini painter, but you know what? I paint a lot of miniatures and they look fine. They always impress people from outside of the hobby space that aren't influenced by the quality of these master painters. So how do I paint impressive models despite not being good at it? I fake it. <laughs> Over time, I've developed a 10-step process for pretending to be good at miniature painting. The Zenithal Prime is by far the biggest and best cheat for faking skill. Why waste time learning how to appropriately highlight objects and understand light sources? I do this with an airbrush and ink because it's the fastest way to do it. It does offer the smoothest results, but honestly, if we're talking about low skill painting, this smoothness is not gonna make a big difference. You can do this by dry brushing. You can also do it by spray painting with rattle cans. My good bud Brent, one of the dudes really pushing the painting doesn't have to be complicated mindset has a wonderful video comparing different ways to do this, which shows in detail how it affects the outcome. The other reason for priming like this is so that you can actually make sense of all the little details on a model and tell what the hell you're painting. Generally, I'll do metallics next. If there's only a few metal details, then I'll leave this step for later. But when there's lots, I find it easier to fix the mistakes when I've applied the metal in this order. I use both good quality hobby paints and cheap craft paints interchangeably for this step. Now, I've found that what matters most is high coverage. And I get that both out of the uh, Vallejo model air metallics and these folk art craft paints, specifically their treasure gold line. Now the air paints are thin and flow into details well, which is great for things like chain. The craft paint is a lot thicker and more viscous, so it's better for covering big flat areas in one pass. The final results are pretty similar between both. I used both on this model, even on the same area, and you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. Now, I'm not saying that what metallics you use don't matter, because they kind of do. I have a lot of metallic paints that I found not to be great to work with, specifically miniature paints. It just happens that both of these lines cover very well, despite being on very different ends of the spectrum in terms of quality and price. If you like coloring books, then this is the method for you, using high pigment, low opacity paints to cover these black and white highlights. You can use Citadel contrast paints or Army Painter speed paints or even acrylic inks. They all do basically the same thing. They tint your black and white project with color. This is one of the recent YouTube craze methods that actually encourages and supports minimum skill and effort. And for good reason, it's great. Whether you want to call it underpainting, grisaille, slap chop, whatever, it doesn't matter. The general idea is simple. Get all of your shading done first, then tint it with translucent paint. This is the same idea a lot of tattooers use when tattooing. They'll do the outline and the shading in black, then come back in with color and you have gradients and shading instantly there. It works really well on miniatures. There's a ton of content on YouTube right now going over the differences between speed paint and contrast paint, which to me personally is a bit mind numbing. I have and I use both and I use them interchangeably. I even sometimes mix them right on the model. But they have different mediums, you say. You cannot mix them, you say. You can do it, it's fine, whatever. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Seriously, try not to get too caught up in all the hype talk from pro painters about the minute differences between paints. Unless you're at their level, it ain't gonna matter. 
But one of the most practiced skills in mini painting is blending colors, wet blending. And nobody got time for that. So a huge advantage with these speed type paints is that you can do very lazy transitions between colors right on the model. It's not gonna look amazing. It won't look like an Italian master painted it, but it's gonna look pretty damn convincing on a tiny monster model. You ever look at behind the scenes footage or photos of the practical effects for big movies, stuff like Star Wars and Blade Runner back in the day? The models weren't painted really well. They weren't perfectly wet blended. They just had a good enough paint job to imply what you needed to see. Cause you were seeing it at a distance mixed in with other things. And the same applies with miniatures for gaming or in a diorama. You're not gonna be looking at them this close. All that being said, you might make some sloppy mistakes that are a bit too obvious. So now's a good time to fix up the most egregious errors. And this is where having done the metallics first using high coverage metallics comes in handy because it just takes one pass of the metallics to hide any unsightly color that got where it shouldn't have gotten. I'm gonna say this step is optional because a lot of the upcoming steps are gonna make it kind of irrelevant. We're gonna be hiding a lot of shit real soon. <laughs> This step, I wouldn't skip though. It's pretty important and it makes a big difference. Models are almost always covered in a bunch of details like bone, rope, claws, light colored objects that maybe you don't want severely tinted with saturated paints. Grab some off-white, a bone color, light tan, whatever you got and take a few minutes to paint all of those areas that haven't yet been painted. Take the time to clean up things like teeth. You don't have to be particularly perfect with this, just get the highlights. If you have areas where there's a ton of spiky bits or something, just dry brush them with white. It's good enough. This is gonna look a little funny when you're done, but the next step is gonna rein it all in. Of course, I wouldn't be making these videos without the help of awesome sponsors. Archvillain Games Sci-Fi release this month takes obvious inspiration from everybody's favorite plague-infested space demons, but bring their own unique twists, making this set not only great for proxies for Warhammer, but excellent for other post-apocalyptic and sci-fi fantasy games. These gnarly cosmic horror demons blend the monstrous with the mechanical, creating models that would be right at home in any wasteland war zone. The models all come pre-supported and ready to print. Now there's over 40 unique miniatures in this set, each with their own stylized and sculpted bases that help give them super dynamic poses. This set has a bunch of big chonky boys, which are ideal for the kind of sloppy painting techniques we're covering today. If you want to run an adventure with mutant cyborgs riding motorcycles, machine gun wielding franken trolls, then this is the set for you. I'll put a link in the video description where you can sign up and get these sick minis for yourself. Thanks again to Archvillain Games for making awesome models and sponsoring hobby creators like myself. The big joke in the hobby, Citadel washes are liquid talent, talent in a bottle. You slap it on something painted white or beige and suddenly it looks pretty damn good. Now because of an upcoming step, I don't use a lot of these washes, but I still use Agrax Earthshade and Seraphim Sepia regularly. Specifically, I use them on the areas that just got painted white. They're good right out of the bottle. And I know what you're thinking, can't you just use the contrast paints for this step as well? And you absolutely can. You just wanna thin them down quite a bit to get that kind of wash-like consistency. Now, a skilled and caring painter will often take the time to go onto a model and do a lot of very nice highlights and blends. But that again requires a high skill level and patience. What's much easier is taking a few colors and just stippling them on to the highest points. Doing this is foolproof. You're just applying dots and dashes. No worry about blending. This style doesn't look amazing when it's inspected up close, but from a distance, it looks just convincing enough to add a tiny bit of pop. You don't even have to go crazy doing very much of this. You can just pick a few key elements you want to bring attention to. It's especially effective on materials like leathers and cloth as it gives it a bit of ragged fibrous texture. Now oil washes are the real MVP here. I have a video where I go into detail on the basics of starting to use them, what you need, how to mix them, apply them and clean them. So I won't focus on that much here, 
I just wanna deal with the reservations you might have using them. It's an ugly process and you need to have faith in it when you apply these washes. Stick to blacks, browns, and filthy colors. You want to fully cover your model in this stuff. If you're feeling particularly lazy, just use one blackish brown wash over the entire thing. If you're feeling a little bit more motivated, then maybe use a couple colors and just allow them to mix on the model where they meet. This is going to look bad, especially when wet, but let the washes dry. Then it'll still look pretty bad, but it will look dry and more dirty, and this is when the magic happens. Grab a makeup sponge dipped in some thinner and wipe clean all the raised areas. This is the ultimate in lazy shadows and highlights. It requires absolutely no skill. All the grind stays in the recesses and comes off the raised areas, giving you instant contrast while also giving the model a realistic dirty look. You can take off as much or as little as you want. If your model up to this point is poorly painted with a lot of mistakes, let the filthy oils cover all those mistakes. Now having some technical paints on hand to easily apply effects is well worth it. This deep down dirty rust effect is the best, simplest way to get a believable rusty layer on all your models. It's magic. Just put it on and it like oxidizes or does something and looks exactly like rust. Less is more, try to be a little bit methodical, but when in doubt or when wanting to hide something, just cover it in rust or moss or verdigris or whatever effect is appropriate for the material. This creates one more distracting layer of texture and color that makes the whole mess of your paint job just kind of blend together. If there's a lot going on, a lot of textures, it's hard to see mistakes. You're not gonna tell if you paint it outside the lines a little bit, if it's covered in rust or goop or grime. It's important to give yourself permission to do this and not care that some gatekeeping asshole hobbyist might judge you for it. Screw them. They're not your friend, they're jerks. You're getting stuff done and having a good time doing it and that's all that matters. If you wanna take this one step further, finish it off with a lot of gore. Some blood, some toxic ooze, whatever you can think of to make your model just disgusting. I realize this doesn't necessarily work on like a fantasy model, you know, you have like a brave knight, probably isn't gonna be covered in blood, but hey, might be covered in mud. If you wanna do like strands of liquid spanning across like an open mouth, an easy way to do that is using some clear fishing line. Then mix up your gore of choice. Take some UV resin and some ink of the desired color until you get whatever gross goo you're after. This can be applied to any areas that make sense. You can coat the fishing line with a few layers, curing in between with a UV flashlight to build it up. And with this step, less isn't more, more is more. Go to town, go crazy. For me, this is the most fun part of the whole process. I'm a gore hound. I love 80s horror and practical effects, so the more blood and guts, the better. Now, is this model well painted? No, absolutely not. It's painted like shit. Does it matter? No, because it still looks cool. Model painting is a game of diminishing returns. At the start of it, you put in a bit of effort and you get pretty damn good results. This is where we are with this. You put in a little bit more effort, you get a little bit more results. And as you put in more skill and effort, this increases rapidly, but the actual finished product only increases in tiny incremental amounts. And that's fun for a lot of people. But if you're just trying to get it done, just trying to enjoy a hobby, play games, make cool stuff, your time is probably better spent down here. Just putting in just enough effort to make something cool and be finished and make a lot of it. It's okay to paint models poorly. And if you take anything away from this video, I hope that it's just permission to suck and be lazy and not care about how well other people paint. Just because you see people talking about smooth blends and all this other stuff, doesn't mean you have to try to achieve it yourself. If you just wanna paint models, you just wanna play games, make cool stuff, then just do it. Don't get caught up in those diminishing returns. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did hit the like button, let me know in the comments section below. I'd really like to know if you have a 
favorite way of pretending to be good at painting? Let us all know what it is, because I'm sure uh, I've missed something. If you want to pick up some tools or supplies for your own hobby needs, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have links to the stuff I use regularly, and purchasing through those links helps support this channel. The best way you can support this channel and help me keep making videos is by joining the Black Magic Craft Fellowship on Patreon. I'd love to have you as a member there. That's it. That's all. Cheers. See you again next time. It just happens that both